Hi, Massimo. Hey, Bob. How about you? I can't complain. How are you doing? Can't complain either. <laughs> well, then let's don't. Let's get straight to the conversation and, and cut the complaining. Um, let, me, <laughs> let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available in both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Massimo Piliucci. Is that an acceptable pronunciation? That's pretty good. Yes. You wouldn't, you, it's better than you. It's closer than you would guess to read it. I will say that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, and uh, you are a professor of philosophy at City College of New York, yes. author of a, a book called How to Be a Stoic. Yes. It's a big and enthusiastic following, as does your ongoing writing on that subject. Now, your, does your, writing, your writing appears on your Patreon page, your, your, your How to Be a Stoic blog. Yes, that's correct. It's, it's on Patreon, yes. That's good. Uh, well, you know, it, it's it's one of those interesting things, interesting ideas, like you know, getting paid for 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 actual professional writing. It's a, I know it's a novel idea for some people. But. Yeah, I've never heard of that happening in the history of humankind. <laughs> certainly not within the last ten years. Um, the uh, so people can check you out there. You where you uh, you give practical guidance and on uh, living as a stoic, well well grounded in your conversancy and uh, actual stoic ancient stoic philosophy um, right. <laughs> but we're going to talk about something a little weirder than uh, stoic philosophy we're going to uh talk about whether evolution is conscious and also somewhat relatedly uh maybe whether evolution has a purpose um the occasion for the conversation is a little piece you wrote uh, on this uh, this site of the Evolution Institute, which is run by David Sung Wilson, who's a well-known biologist at uh, Binghamton University. Um, and uh, he wanted to have a kind of a symposium, an online symposium, get people to weigh in on the question right. of whether evolution is conscious. And he kind of surprised me with something he wrote. Uh, he... he in his introduction to this symposium, to which you contributed, he wrote, as we approach the one-fifth mark of the 21st century, the concept of conscious evolution is becoming respect respectable again. I had not heard that. <laughs> had you, had you... Uh, frankly, that surprised the hell out of me as well, and I'm, and I'm an evolutionary biologist, so no, I never heard of it. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. you, I mean, you it's... do hear of people uh, sort of thinking along those lines, but that, that, that's typically a French kind of uh, thinking. It certainly isn't popular among, among biologists that I know of, nor is it popular among philosophers of science, and those, are, I would think, are the two kinds of groups that one would go to for these kind of things in, in the first place. Yeah. So when you say uh, the French have been more sympathetic to this idea, you're thinking about people like Henri Bergson, uh, for example? Right, exactly. Um, that's there, there has always been a group of biologists who have never been sort of mainstream, uh, certainly they're not mainstream now, uh, who have occasionally suggested things like that, yes. Uh, there was also, in sort of in paleontology, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was this idea called orthogenetic evolution, this notion that evolution had a sort of direction in a long, long, long run, like over millions of years. Now that, uh, is that, you think of, Pierre Théo de Chardin or not? Did he use he, it? He certainly built on the, in those ideas. That's right. He, he kind of run, run with those ideas. And those were all ideas that actually were popular during a period that historians of science called the eclipse of Darwinism. This mm. was a period during which, you know, between the late 19th century and early 20th century, when Darwinism was in, in crisis for a number of reasons, one of them was the paleontologists uh, didn't, didn't really go along with it because they were seeing these long term trends in, in the fossil record that they couldn't reconcile in their mind with natural selection, with the concept of natural selection. Then in 1900, of course, there was the rediscovery of, of Mendel's work and the birth of modern genetics. And initially that created a problem because it looked like if inheritance is particulate, so if there are you know, part, specific particles, the genes mm -hmm. that are in charge of heredity, then how is that Gonna gonna allow natural selection to work on quantitative characters that vary in a continuous uh, fashion, yeah. and in fact that particular problem, the the uh, apparent disagreement between Darwinism and Mendelism, as it was called, took uh, you know a biology kept biologists occupied for two or three decades in the nineteen twenties and thirties. 
until they come up with what is uh, known as the modern synthesis, which is the current standard model in evolutionary biology, which actually, in fact, recon uh, reconciles the two via the birth of population and statistical genetics. Okay. Yeah, and I should uh, confess, as I guess I haven't yet on this particular podcast, that, that I've actually argued that there is um, some reason to think that evolution may have a purpose that is unfolding. I mean, this would just be, you know, nuts and bolts, natural selection, not not anything spooky or mystical, and not necessarily associated with any consciousness. Uh, but, but so, I, and maybe I'll flesh that out uh, if we have time later. But on, so on this question of consciousness... Um, whether evolution is conscious, um, maybe we should start by uh, defining consciousness. Now, you, um, you know, the, 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 the symposium is introduced by David Sloan Wilson, as we said, and he, in, you know, not quite defining consciousness, but characterizing it, says he associates it with such attributes as you know, deliberate, intentional, purposeful, calculated, planned, volitional. Right. You, you, you accept that. I was wondering um, how you feel about my own preferred way of talking about it, which is fairly common among philosophers, the, the phrase that, that comes from Thomas Nagel, which is just that when we say that something's conscious, we mean that it is like something to be that thing. I may not know exactly what it's like to be my dog, Frazier, but if I believe that he has consciousness, what I believe is that it's like something to be him. Right. Do you not like that uh, characterization? No, I, I like it. I think they actually refer to two different uh, uh, but overlapping conceptions of com unconsciousness. I think the broader definition of consciousness is exactly the one you just gave. Okay. It, it's the capacity that certain living organisms uh, have of you know, having a first-person experience, essentially, of you know, feeling things, pain, perceiving red color or something like that. Um, the one that David uh, started with is, I think, a subset because it applies only to human consciousness and possibly to the to some degree to consciousness in some uh, you know large brain primates. So that's the the subset of conscious animals that are capable not just of having first person experiences, uh, but also of doing the kinds of things that he was listing there, being you know making purposeful decisions, reflecting on those things, you know going after uh, things for a particular reason that they can they're able to state to themselves. That, mm -hmm. as far as we know, is pretty much only human beings, maybe some other animals on Earth, and of course, if there are you know aliens out there, they're capable of something like that. But as far as I know, that's pretty much human beings. Okay. Um, so you're, you're right. In the, the, gen the more general definition of consciousness is the one you gave. But, but it's interesting, as you notice, that David started out with the other one, which is the, f the one that really raised my sort of uh, uh, you know, alert, alert uh, bells in a little bit. Yeah, you were not, you were not uh, sympathetic to his claims, uh, or, or at least you, your, your piece kind of... Um, I don't know that you mentioned him by name, but it's pretty clear that you're objecting in some sense to his giving the question, framing the question the way he does as a, as, as a question that really is making a comeback um, and, and um, as a question that's best thought of the way, the exact way he's thinking about it. So, so you're seeing, so, so, so as you read David, he would say when he says evolution is consciousness, he means specifically that, it is. It has some of these, at least some of these attributes, uh, intentional, purposeful. But also, it is like something to be evolution because, as you're, you, you see these attributes as a this characterization involving these attributes as a subset. Uh, it's right. one way for it to be like something to be you. That's right. Now that sounds really strange to me. I mean, both both propositions actually sound very strange. Mm -hmm. I mean, I. You know, the way David phrases, of course, as I said, it focuses on the volition part. To me, in order to have volition, you know, as a biologist, the only organisms that have volition and they have purpose and things like that are the, the same kind of organisms, you know, a subset of, of those organisms that actually have also first-person experience. But either way you, you, you put it, it sounds very strange to me as a biologist that another biologist would talk in terms of, in those terms, uh, when it comes to evolution, natural selections, or things like that. I mean, who is doing or what is doing the, 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 the first-person experience? What is doing, who is doing or what is doing the thinking, the volition, the planning, or anything like that? That's, that's a yeah. 
Well, since you really, I have a kind of objection to it that is related to yours. And it goes like this. Like when I imagine, when I ask myself, well, maybe evolution has uh, a, a purpose in some sense. It was like, you know, whether it was, you know, the first form of life was planted by aliens because they wanted uh, this purpose to unfold or even the purpose could even be imbued in a certain sense by something other than a conscious and intelligent agent. But we'll, we'll get back to that if we if we have time for it. My point is that when I when I think of these scenarios, I think, well, maybe the purpose is to create a giant global superorganism. After all, it did give rise to intelligent life, which through cultural evolution invented these technologies. Now we have the Internet looks like a giant global brain. Maybe you can think of humankind as a superorganism. And the purpose of, of evolution was to create this superorganism. Okay, fine. That's at least conceit. You can at least conceive of that. But if that's the case, then the what evolution itself is kind of analogous to. So, in other words, if a superorganism, if right. the purpose of the first form of life was to unfold into this global superorganism, just as the uh, purpose of a, uh, a an egg, a squirrel's egg, is to create a squirrel, purpose in quotes, you know you know what I mean? I mean, that, yep, that, yep, yep. How, whether or not you want to use the word purpose per se, you know what I mean? Um, uh, well, then what, well, then what's analogous to natural so, uh, evolution by natural selection is the process of the squirrel's ontogeny, that is the, the, the squirrel's um, yep. or is it phylogeny, <laughs> which is it, is it phylogeny? Anyway, you know, the squirrel's okay. maturation. Right, on top of that's right. Of embryogenesis. So and right. and we would not say we wouldn't say that the squirrel's embryogenesis, the squirrel's un- maturation is conscious. We say the squirrel is conscious, right? So right. in other words, it seems to me more a more plausible qu- question of whether uh, social systems may have a, a consciousness that transcends the individual consciousness of their constituents, namely us. Uh, the, uh, like you, I have trouble wrapping my mind around the idea of the process of evolution being consciousness. Or I should say, right. I have even more trouble than I have imagining the giant superorganism. Right. <laughs> now, that makes sense? yeah, absolutely, it makes perfect sense. Now, I tend to be skeptical also of the of the, uh, of the super, you know, giant sure. superorganism kind of thing. But there, I think there is much more to to discuss, and it's much more, uh, you know, complicated. And in fact, I think I suspect that that's one of the. Uh, one of the starting points for David, because David is, is, uh, has made his career as a biologist uh, by studying uh, and, and, and pushing the idea of group selection. And mm-hmm. so he's very interested in superorganisms uh, as instantiated by insect colonies, for instance, you know, termites and you know, bees and things like that. Mm-hmm. So there is a connection there. But, mm-hmm. but I think one, one of the ma- my major objections in, in that article, in that essay, is that I think there is a confusion in, in the very setting of the question, between what philosophers call teleonomy and teleology, and so yeah, we should, we should make talk, that we should make right. that distinction, which you make in the paper. Go ahead. So, so teleology is um, a process or a, or, a, or a, that is characterized characterized by actual purpose, mm-hmm. while teleonomy uh, refers to processes that look like they have a purpose, but they don't. Right. So uh, the, the, the obvious examples are the distinction between natural selection and artificial selection, uh, which is, of course, a distinction that Darwin used very well, uh, you know, to, to, to great effect in The Origin of Species. Now, uh, the idea is that natural, uh, sorry, artificial selection is clearly a teleological process. There's somebody's thinking about what they're doing. Uh, somebody's making conscious decisions. They, they want dog breeds or pigeon breeds or something like that to look in a certain way. And so they are consciously selecting certain kinds of animals over others, right? So that's a teleological process because it not only looks like it's got a purpose, it actually does have a purpose. There is a thinking being that is doing mm-hmm. uh, the, the operation, that's guiding the operation. A teleonomic process, like natural selection, according to Darwin, is one that looks like it's got... A, 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 you know something in mind, but in fact there is no mind. There is nothing out there. There is no, no. There is nobody upstairs actually making the decisions. What it is, it's a natural process that step by step uh, eliminates certain uh, characteristics or certain living or certain organs because they are not adaptive because they are, they they just fail to reproduce. And by this step by step process. Uh, you know, if you look at it several generations later, it looks like, oh my gosh, 
this thing came up with a, a human eye, which is an incredibly complicated and, you know, uh, 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 organ and it looks designed, it looks engineered, but in fact it wasn't engineered. It wasn't, there was nobody sitting down there trying to design a, a, human, a human eye. It just uh, took, took shape over many, many generations, over many, many different species, um, starting out probably with something like, you know, a, a, a simple cell that was sensitive to light and then eventually getting more and more complicated. So that, that was Darwin's brilliant insight to separate the teleonomy from the teleology, that was essentially his response to William Paley's argument from intelligent design. Mm -hmm. You know, Paley famously said that, uh, you know, if you find a watch during a during during a, a walk on the beach, then you immediately know that there was a designer because the watch has a purpose. Mm -hmm. And Darwin responded that all sorts of other things appear to have a purpose, but they don't have a purpose. We should talk about function. The human eye has a function. But right. it doesn't have a purpose because it wasn't designed by anybody sitting there. Right. Consciously. Now, yeah. And so, and of course, this was the inspiration for uh, the title of um, Richard Dawkins's book, The Blind Watchmaker. Yes. Um, you know, because, yeah, pa Paley was a, was a theologian. And th in an exercise of natural theology, he said, well, clearly a watch, you, you see a watch, you, you know it's designed. You see a rock, you don't have any reason to think it is. Well, what if you see an animal? What is an animal more like, a rock yeah. or a or watch. He says it's like a watch, so it must have a designer. Exactly. The designer must be God. Now, um, one interesting, well, I don't want to get there quite yet, but 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 to drill down on this teleonomy uh, idea, I, I, I so so you're use are you applying it to natural selection or to the eyeball? In other words, are you saying the eyeball looks as if it has a purpose, but it doesn't have a purpose in the sense that a pocket watch does? Right. Or are you saying, because the analogy is, is you know, eyeball is to pocket watch as natural selection is to person who designed the pocket watch. Right? That's right. That's right. And so, and so we would say, well, I guess we would say the pocket watch has a purpose and the designer was purposeful. Is that what we would yes. say? Yes, I think that's what we would say. And in the case of natural selection, I would say that natural selection is the teleonomic process and it produces teleonomic objects. Teleonomic objects. Okay. Right. And so, I, I, you know, it's funny. When I, I looked up after reading your thing, I looked up the... Uh, uh, you, you had links to definitions of teleonomy and, and, and teleology... And there does seem to be, by some definitions, um, emphasis on this consciousness question. In other words, uh, to be teleological, you do have to have consciousness in, in one by one definition, right? Whereas yeah. something teleonomic would look very much like, or its products would look like the products of something teleological, but it would not have consciousness. Right. That's correct. And that actually goes down to the definition, to, the, to this other distinction that should be clear between a function and a purpose. Right? Mm -hmm. So typically biologists, ever since Darwin, talk about biological structures as having functions, not purposes. The function of my heart is to pump blood, not to make noise, for instance, even though it does both, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how you distinguish an adaptation from a, a byproduct. The fact that the heart makes noise, it's a byproduct of its operation, but its actual function is that of, of pumping blood, and that's the adaptive function, because, of course, without that one, we would be in trouble. Right. Um, that's how you use the word function in biology. On the other hand... If I were to pick up, you know, my 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 phone uh, that I'm using now to sort of sort of help recording this this conversation, then obviously that phone has purpose purposes, not just it has functions. Of course, we don't we normally talk if, uh, in terms of functions, but those functions are purposeful functions. They're the result of some kind of engineering design. Somebody actually sat down and said, "Okay, what could, could people find interesting or useful in a phone, and how you are you going to get there?" There's nothing like that so far as we can tell, in natural selection. Now, it's interesting you mentioned earlier, the only possible exception that I can see to that is, in fact, the possibility, which cannot be excluded, of course, ruled out, that an alien race actually seeded the Earth and maybe other planets at some point, you know, four, three billion years ago or something like that, in which case that's, a, that's, a, that's called the panspermia hypothesis for the origin of life, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, that's definitely a possibility. And if that's the case, then in a sense... Uh, we would be all, we meaning not just human beings, but everything, every living organism on Earth, would be the result of a of a teleological process. Now that's interesting because, in other words, uh, 
in that scenario, whether we are teleological objects or teleonomic objects uh, is not uh, a function of of our physical form or even our metaphysical properties in a sense. It's not it's not a question of whether in that in that view, it's not a question of whether we have consciousness or in other words, you can't assess the system. And even if you know everything about the system per se, as it exists in time right now, you can't assess it and conclude whether it's teleonomic or teleological. You have to know about its history and whether That's there was right. intentionality in That's right. the process, somewhere in the process, even if only at the beginning of the process, that created that's correct. And so the re that's exactly right. You can't just look at the product. You have to look at the history of the product. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, you can make reasonable inferences. Uh, you know, if we do compare an eye with a watch, we do agree with, with Paley that the watch was designed. But that's only because we know about designers. We know about watches. We know what, what, where watches normally come from. So we make a reasonable inference and say, ah, it's a watch, so it must have been designed. But that if we didn't know that, then it would be difficult to tell apart a, a, the, the, the result of a teleonomic from a teleological process unless you knew something about, you know, it's, as you pointed out, it's, it's history. Now, mm -hmm. the only reason I'm skeptical about the possibility that natural selection on Earth is an actual teleological process is because, yes, I grant the, the, the logical po possibility that, uh, of the panspermia hypothesis. I just don't see any positive reason to believe it at the moment. Uh, and therefore, I rather go, you know, use Occam razor in my mind, basically, and say, well, probably the origin of life on Earth was a natural process. And if it was a natural process, then we're talking teleonomy. Also, don't forget, of course, that even if the panspermia hypothesis is in fact correct, and it turns out that our planet was seeded, then that pushes, that doesn't really solve the origin, the origin of life question. It simply pushes it back by one or two oh, yeah, or three more but steps. But I don't think that's I don't think that's an important objection. I mean, you could have said the same thing to Darwin. He says, "Hey, I figured out what created life, natural selection." And you say, "Well, that's not interesting because you didn't tell us how natural selection got here." Well, I'm no, that was significant progress to figure out that natural selection created animals. And and the only reason people think it's some kind of powerful objection to say, "Oh, but if you can't, you know, but but that only takes us one level back is if they think you are trying to provide a theological answer in the sense that theologies traditionally have. Right? And that was the only reason for my objection, that you're yeah. correct. It's not a strong objection on scientific grounds. It is a strong objection on theological grounds, I worry, because say, hold on, uh, what are you saying here? Are you saying there was never a natu natural origin of life? Because that now raises the bar significantly, if that's the claim. Right. But if that's not the claim, if the claim is simply, hey, life originated somewhere else in the universe, and then one of these living things happened to be here on Earth, and, and decided to, to seed it, fine, that's not a problem. There's also a possibility, by the way, not all panspermia hypotheses are intelligence-driven. Uh, you know, in fact, the original version, one of the original versions of the panspermia hypothesis, which was produced back in the 1920s, I believe, uh, actually assumed that, that, that uh, spores of, you know, things like bacteria right. would survive in space inside meteorites or comets or something like that, and then eventually it would, would end up on a planet that is suitable for life and life would, would restart over mm -hmm. there. In which case, if that's the case, if that's the kind of panspermia we're talking about, then we're, we're back to teleonomy and not teleology. Right. Uh, and of course, I mean, there's a separate question of like, what is the teleonomic object? Are we saying that I am a teleonomic object? Well, by your use of the terms, we already know that because, uh, you know, we just by virtue of the fact that natural selection created me. I mean, that's enough for you to call me teleonomic. Right. The question of whether the global superorganism is teleonomic, uh, I don't know. That, that that might be. No, that's a good. That's a good way to think about it, actually. Because so let's talk about something that it's clearly man-made. Like, in fact, it was one of the examples that Dave uh, brought up at the beginning in in his essay. That's genetic algorithms in computers, right? Right. So, I would make the following argument, which is actually off of what you just said. Um, the genetic algorithms themselves, you know, the idea of a genetic algorithm and, and as well as specific starting point for a genetic algorithm are definitely teleological, meaning that somebody had to actually design the computer, somebody had to implement the, the you know, the seed program. But and by genetic mean, algorithms, we mean actual computer programs correct. that simulate evolution. There's an algorithm that drives exactly. 
Exactly. Right. Or uh, in a similar fashion, neural networks, again, within computers, right? right? So somebody, those are teleological in the sense that somebody had to build the computer and somebody had to get started the neural net. However, if you let either neural networks or uh, genetic algorithms in the sense of computer programs evolve for a long time, I'm not so sure that it's reasonable to argue that all of the outputs of those programs in the long term are in fact teleological because the original designer didn't, pres- didn't in fact foresee most or any or even of those, of those outcomes. What it did was to set, out the, you know, set up the thing in motion. That's the teleological part. But the specific outcomes are actually teleonomic. They're not the result of a direct planning. You know, it's not like an engineer who sits down or, or like a computer programmer in the old-fashioned way that actually writes down the code for every line on the program. If you actually start the program as a seed and then let it evolve, then it seems to me that the, you're, you have a system now that it's an interesting mix of teleonomy and teleology. The beginning, the starting point is teleological, but the continuation is teleonomic. Now, the analogy there would be with a situation in which uh, we had a panspermia uh, scenario seeded by intelligent organisms, right? Mm-hmm. So you could say that the beginning, the seeding, is a teleological process. But the fact that you and I are here to talk about this, you know, three, three and a half billion years later, or the fact that there are squirrels around three, three and a half billion years later, that's not necessarily the result of a teleological process because the original cedars didn't necessarily foresee that human beings or squirrels or whatever else came out of the process. So the mm-hmm. process after the beginning was actually teleonomic. Yeah. You know, one thing I'm realize, I realized when I uh, came across this, I mean, I had heard the distinction between teleonomy and teleology, and I'd assumed that teleonomy was just a way to kind of deal with the fact that organisms are clearly goal-seeking in some sense. I mean, whether or not they have consciousness, they they, they pursue right. goals. So, uh, teleonomy gives you a way to talk about that without sounding too mystical, I guess. Uh, yes. but, 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 so I see that distinction, but I'm only now realizing that when I say uh, that I think there's reason to suspect that evolution has a purpose, I'm actually agnostic on the question of whether it's teleological or teleonomic. And let me explain what I mean by that, okay? Yep. Because, um, so first of all, just the, 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 the short version of the argument is this. So as you said, you know, William Paley argued in the 18th century, I think, that, um, look, pocket watches are definitely different from rocks, and animals are more like pocket watches than rocks, so animals must have a designer. Richard Dawkins writes a book about, you know, jumping off from this uh, historical episode uh, called The Blind Watchmaker. And he makes an interesting concession, Dawkins does in that book. He says, Paley was right to say that animals and plants are, are, are in a special category and, deserve, and, and, and demand a special kind of explanation. Yes. Whatever produced them is different from what produced rocks, okay? Yep. And... And uh, and one of the things he would say certainly is that um, they are goal seeking, and and uh, they are they are goal uh, pursuing. They act as if they have this goal. There, there, there's a lot of uh, to get genes in the next generation, and then various goals that are kind of subordinate to that or intermediate to that, uh, mm-hmm. like finding a, a sex partner or eating enough food to stay alive until you get your gene. Whatever they pursue various goals. And then just structurally, you know, if you watch uh, a, a, an organism mature, you, you see that there's this movement um, toward uh, functional specialization. Um, you know, as it, it grows, it gets more complex and it gets, uh, you know, uh, uh, less amorphous, more, more distinct and more distinctly specialized and, and so on. So you get functional integration at this higher level of organization than, than the egg itself was at and so on. So... Um, now, as you said, the fact, uh, by, by your, by the terminology you want to use, the teleonomic, teleological stuff, um, once we conclude that the animals are in this special category, we're, if that's all we've concluded, then, then we're, then we're not sure whether they're teleonomic or teleological. Right. You have to know more about their history to conclude that, okay? That's right. So, so here's my argument about evolution, is that, if you were watching evolution unfold on this planet all the way from primordial ooze to uh, 
uh, giant global brain, which of course includes cultural evolution, but that was spawned by biological evolution, you know, the cultural evolution involving technological change and so on. If you, if you saw that in time lapse, uh, you might see some similarities between that and the maturation of an organism, say a flower or, you know, whatever. You, you, get, uh, you get more and more uh, functional, uh, functionally distinct things. You get different species and so on. They do different things. There is a kind of interdependence among them. They, they do things for each other. They provide the, the food for, you know. So you could say, well, the, the, there is a kind of um, interdependence of them as there is with your distinct organs and so on. I, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to, uh, I don't want to have that argument now. I just want to jump to the, uh, but, 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 but you see the structure of it, that if, that if I right. got into it, I'd argue that, that actually Dawkins has said you can look at a physical system and decide, is it more like a rock or is it in this uh, category that demands special explanation? I would argue that the uh, unfolding of evolution on this planet has some of the hallmarks of the systems we put in the special uh, in the special explanation category, but I'm agnostic as to whether, uh, if that turns out to be true, that they that they belong there, and in some sense uh, had a, a, a teleonomic or teleological purpose imbued, um, I'm agnostic as to whether it was teleonomic or teleological, and the reason I say that is because you can imagine a meta-natural selection process. I mean, you, you're probably familiar with Lee Smolin's uh, cosmic natural selection where yes. universes uh, create um, copies of themselves. So those universes most conducive to replication are the kind we come to have. Now, in the, in the meat and potatoes version of that, what that means, one thing that could imply is you get universes with a lot of black holes because that could be the portal through which birth is given to new universes. And I, I've talked to Lee about this, and, and uh, I think it's fair to say well, I won't characterize you. I think he was agreeing that in principle, and certainly there are people who have taken it in this direction. In principle, you could come up with a scenario where intelligent life, for one reason or another, is conducive to the eventual replication of the universe. Like uh, maybe they come up with a technology for creating black holes. That's a. Uh, in fact, I had a conversation with a guy who believes that. I can link. We can link to it. A mathematician. But but anyway, the the point is that if you take the step. If you imagine a case where intelligent life is a prerequisite for generating more universes, then you can imagine, in principle, uh, the uh, life originating uh, with, in some sense, a purpose that then unfolds, life originating on this planet through a teleonomic means. In other words, you, you eventually get universes that are just likely, by virtue of their initial conditions, just likely to generate life on various planets. Yeah. And that is because that is itself conducive to, and, and, and the directional evolution that follows, in other words, an evolution that's likely to create intelligent life, that that is likely to lead to the birth of universes. Do you at least follow the argument? Yeah, I do. The, the thing is, I don't object to anything you said, uh, except for one thing, that, that every step that you introduce there brings us further and further away from actual science and into, you know, pure, pure speculation, you know, metaphysics and so on and so forth. So, for instance, let's, let me give a couple of examples. So, I, I, I'm actually sympathetic to a lot of Lee Smolin's work, except to that particular one you actually mentioned. And the reason for that is because I think Either he's using natural selection, you know, cosmic natural selection, as a very broad analogy, and it doesn't actually mean uh, a, a detailed analogy correspondence with the process of natural selection in biology, or he doesn't understand natural selection in biology, because there's some major differences there. Uh, one of the things, for instance, is it's not clear at all uh, where this, this, this process of selection is happening. In, in, in biological organisms, selection usually happens because there is limited resources. Mm -hmm. And so there is competition for resources. It's not clear to me in what sense, you know, universes uh, uh, might, might actually uh, fight yeah. with each other for resources. It's, th that seems like a, a fairly major disanalogy there. Um, there's another issue, of course. Natural selection implies an inheritance system. And I actually asked this to Lee, to Lee uh, a few years ago when I wrote a couple of, of uh, uh, blog, blog posts about, about his, um, his book. And I said, so what do you envisage the, the, the mechanism of inheritance to be? 
and and he he doesn't have one. <laughs> he basically says, "Well, I'm assuming that the laws of nature from one universe get inherited, you know, get get or or, or only sm- small, you know, only through mm, via small tweaks get inherited through to, to the to the baby universe that originates from it." I said, "Yeah, but." But you're just assuming that there's no reason, no theoretical reason to actually believe that there is a mechanism of inheritance of laws from one universe to the other. Mm-hmm. So, so he's getting way speculative. And as a scientist, you know, as a philosopher, I kind of like that. It's fine. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. It's that's the fun thing to do. But as a scientist, I tend I tend to say, okay, hold on a second. Now you, we we moved way past anything that we are capable, uh, even even. For in the foreseeable future to actually test empirically even even small portions mm-hmm. of it, so I'm a little nervous when people make that yeah. kind of argument. But sure, if the general question is, is that kind of scenario so logically consistent? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 we need to be careful, however, when we talk about you know, is it possible? Because the answer to that question is almost always yes. Mm-hmm. The only things that are impossible, as far as we can tell are things that violate the laws of logic, you know, things that, or mathematics, things that involve right. internal contradictions. But that's, there's a, a, a almost infinite, in fact, an infinite number of things that don't violate uh, the laws of logic or mathematics. And so there is an infinite number of possibilities. So something, to say that some, to agree that something is possible isn't really to agree too much. The question is, is it likely? Is, is that a likely explanation right. for, uh, you know, whatever question we have? Uh, at hand, right. in, and and that there, I think is where where things get a little right. more complicated. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I, and Lee, I'm sure would say yes. It's highly speculative. Of course, some philosophy inherently is. I mean, certain aspects of metaphysics are just not going to be, yes. for example, are not going to be amenable to scientific testing. I, I don't think he denied that it's uh, very speculative. You can come up with answers to the questions you raise, like why would there be uh, finite resources? Well. Uh, it, it could be that, I mean, who knows what life is like outside of a universe where the birth takes place, right? I mean, it's right. like once you, go, sure. once you go through a black hole, you can posit that to muster some sort of metaphysical energy to create the algorithm that b- gives birth to the, the, the next universe draws on some finite something. I mean, you can, you can, you can assert that, but, but I, I would say that um, the, uh, the argument – the part of my argument I started with that actually um, the uh, the process of the unfolding of um, evolution as we've seen it is is closer to the unfolding of an organism than you might imagine, uh, including uh, such features as I would argue. Um, there's reason to think that more and more complex life was actually likely to develop, ultimately involving life intelligent enough to launch technological evolution. Uh, I mean, that's an argument you can have, and obviously yeah. people agree, and some people think it wasn't likely, but, but my point is that uh, that's at least the basis for, for an argument uh, that, that is relevant um, to, to the question. So if I could convince you that actually – a species that gives rise to te- technological evolution that leads to a giant global brain is actually pretty likely. Um, then, to my mind, that strengthens the case, however speculative, that, uh, okay, this is, uh, the, the, it increases the, the, the uh, plausible, I guess, estimate of the probability that, in some sense, it's a purpose unfolding. The, re- the reason I brought in the uh, Smolin thing is to emphasize that I'm agnostic on whether, if you buy that argument, you're talking yeah. teleonomy or teleology. I yeah. have no idea. Right. Now, all, I'm, right. all I would be saying is the system has uh, some of the characteristics we see. I guess I would say the only other systems we know of that have these characteristics, we all agree are uh, teleonomic. You know, right. we, we all agree that they, in some sense, actually can be said to pursue goals. Yeah. Now, let me make a comment, if you don't mind, about about this process of unfolding, which, you know, the, the, interestingly, uh, from an etymological perspective, the word evolution actually does mean unfolding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is sort of, sort of interesting, pertinent to this discussion. But we, brought, we, we talked about Richard Dawkins before. So let me, let me talk a little bit about the ideas of Dawkins' historical arch-rival, Stephen Jay Gould. So 
Gould wrote in an interesting book. Of course, at the moment, I don't remember the title, but I'll, I'll look it up. And if one, you wonderful it. life, wonderful life. No, it's the one in which he talks about the evolutional complexity. And, and so there is, the, Gould made an, made an interesting argument. He said, you know, so often people talk about evolution having a direction and going into more and more mm-hmm. complex things. And, you know, isn't that interesting? Isn't that uh, kind of a suspicious that it's going in a certain direction? And, and his answer was, well, maybe. On the other hand, there's another way to think about it. It had to start simple. If it's a natural process, that is, if it's not designed from the top down, it had to start simple. The first living organism had to be the simplest possible things you can imagine as a biological system, because otherwise that wouldn't be a, a natural process. Well, if you start simple, there is only one way you can go. You can't, you can't, if right. you change, you have to go complex. Right. And once you get started that, um, um, he, he, his analogy was with the, 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 the classic example of the guy that starts, uh, the, 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 the drunken man that starts the, with a yeah, lamp. The, ran, the random walk. If, you, if yeah, you're walking. Random walk. It's like if you got to go f- away from the, you, you end up right. going if, away from the lamppost. If a drunk has a wall on one side and he walks randomly, he will tend to move away from the wall because he can't get to the other side of it. So, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. No. So that's one argument for like, you know, well, of course we have complexity because we had to start simple. Yeah. The other observation Gould never tired of making, I think, is, is one of perspective. That is, sure, if we look at the world as it is now, right, we see millions of species, some of them fairly complex. And, of course, we see ourselves, the most complex of all living organisms, certainly in terms of, you know, brain power and things like that. Mm-hmm. But he said, yeah, but, but put things in perspective. First of all, for a billion and a half, close to a billion years of evolution on Earth, which is the majority of the time, there were only bacteria. There was nothing other than unicellular organisms. Yeah. Moreover, still today, in fact, the most frequent and most abundant in terms of biomass and number of, of cells uh, of individuals form of life on Earth is, in fact, bacteria. So he said, you know, let's be careful about thinking just how cool we are, these, these really complex things, because, in fact, we're kind of... Uh, uh, in a sense, sort of an afterthought. We're, we're, we're there, yes, but we're really, um, in terms of biomass and number of individuals, a very tiny component of the biosphere. Now, you can say, you know, th- there's arguments and counter-arguments about that thing. I, the only reason I brought it up is because sometimes it's a little too easy to slip into this kind of teleonomic and even teleological talk because we look at things from our perspective and, it's, and we say, oh my gosh, look how cool we are. How is it possible that we got so cool? Well, yeah. one of the answers is it just was a result of a random walk. Yeah. I'm involved in a little bit of backstory here. So in Gould, there were actually two books. One was called uh, Wonderful Life. It was about the Burgess Shale ostensibly. Yes. But, but the point of it, the payoff of the book was, look how unlikely it was that you would wind up with human beings. Um, because look, I mean, Neanderthals could have killed us off or the whole primate lineage could have been killed off and, and so on. I wrote a review of the book in the New Republic that was pretty close to the first nasty review he ever got. <laughs> because he was at that point the darling, yeah. the darling. Uh, and I pointed out, among other things, that, um, yeah, but nobody nobody thinks that human beings per se were in the cards. The only f- interesting question is, was intelligent life, uh, I mean, of some kind in the ca- cards? In other words, obviously, there's enough contingency that any number of uh, kind of candidates for first form of truly intelligent life are going to get killed off. The yeah. question is, if you look at evolution broadly, uh, you know, is it likely? I made the case that it was likely. Uh, and believe me, believe me, uh, uh, that review got his attention. I happen to know. Oh, yeah, I know. In, in any <laughs> event, sure. he wrote, so he wrote the second book, whose title neither of us uh, can recall, where he, ma- where he says he grants for the first time. Because I had to say in that first review, look, hey, Stephen Jay Gould. The question isn't, does every uh, lineage have some kind of inexorable impetus toward a greater complexity? The, the, the question, or a int- an interesting question is, over time, if you look at the most complex form of life, you know, the outer envelope of biological complexity, does that tend to get higher and not lower? And of course, it does tend to get higher, right? Yes. And, 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 and that, is a, that is an essential piece of the argument that eventually you're going to get something so complex and behaviorally complex that it's intelligent. So anyway... Then he writes a second book, and uh, 
he says, okay, like, yeah, things get more complex, but it's only because of this drunken walk dynamic uh, that, you know, they start out at zero complexity. Of course, they get more complex. And, and I wrote uh, a reply to that in my book, uh, Non-Zero, which uh, the, the reply was excerpted in the New Yorker. And I said such things as you're neglecting some things. I mean, of course, that's part of the answer. It can't get less complex than zero complexity. Randomness alone would take you away from it. But you're missing such obvious things as arms races between species, right? We know that that leads to like, you know, one, one species will develop things and the other will develop some counter technology. We know that happens. Right. That's a dynamic generating complexity. We know that uh, kin selection at, at the cellular level, when you have clonally related cells, makes it more likely that you'll get cooperation among cells just as it does at higher levels. And so, so I right. said, look, there's all these dynamics you are mysteriously I guess they just escaped his notice, but there's more, there's reason to believe there's a lot, there are more dynamics behind the growth in complexity than just the random walk. Now, that said, I don't think that is all that relevant to the question of purpose, because even if the only source of the growth in complexity were the random walk, you can imagine some alien going, well, you got this algorithm, natural selection, and through the process of the random walk, it'll create more complex stuff. Sure. Eventually. So let's seed a planet with it. Sure. It really, the question is not how many different sources of, of growing complexity are there. The question is how likely was the complexity to grow? How sure. likely were thresholds to be crossed like multicellular life, which has been invented more than once, as you know, how likely um, were you to get intelligent life, cultural level, and so on. Now, it's a very speculative argument that this stuff was likely, but it's right. not an argument that's devoid of evidence. You can say No, I, I agree. I agree. I, I'm not so sure. I'm going to be a little bit more charitable, I guess, with, with, with Gould. I'm not so I don't think that, that, he, that, that he didn't take into account competition. I mean, he actually wrote about arms races and things like that. But in that particular book, his emphasis was on random walks and, and the beginning of the process. And so he may have uh, sort of either underplayed or, or you know, sort of not, not written about in that particular context of this room. You're absolutely right. Yes. Even if it started out with a random walk, which I think it's a reasonable, a reasonable hypothesis, hypothesis saving for the possibility of an actual seeding by extraterrestrials. And as you said, even there, uh, the extraterrestrials might have exploited the, the, mm -hmm. the idea of a, of a random walk. Yes, after that, there are ecological dynamics that, pl that come into play. So you would expect things to become more and more complex because there's going to be more and more competition for smaller and smaller resources, right? And once you've exhausted all of the niches in terms of, you know, simple, sing sing you know, uh, single-cell organisms, then the next logical step is, hey, why don't we get together some cells and create this thing that has more flexibility, it's better able to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, drive out the, 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 the competition. Well, and then well once especially given that the cells are often next to, to cells that share 100% of their genes because they Correct. reproduce lonely. That increases the chances. Correct, exactly. Now, there is an interesting book that I... We, if you don't mind, we should link to, although it's a fairly technical one. Uh, it came out a John few years Maynard ago. Smith? The John Maynard Smith book? No, I'm thinking, yeah, that's a good, that was a good guess. But no, it's... That's uh, a good counter argument. He and his co-author, yeah. who I think may be, uh, may be contributing to the symposium we started off talking about. Such uh, Marty, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they made the argument that the evolution of intelligent life was not likely... And you should take it seriously because John Maynard Smith was a very smart uh, yes, guy. But, he was a very uh, smart guy. Yeah. But uh, the argument that I'm, uh, the, the book I'm thinking of is by Samir Okasha, who is a philosopher of, of science, a philosopher of biology. And he's interested, he actually wrote a, what in my mind is the best book uh, uh, on offer on uh, group selection, or, or as he calls it more properly, multi level selection. And one of the things that he does in that book is to reinterpret the, the, the uh, Maynard Smith Zatmari. Uh, suggestions that have been that, 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 that the history of life has been characterized by a series of jumps, essentially transitions. Right. I call them transitions, right? right? And he interprets interprets those transitions as each one of them is made possible by a a kind of group selection. Uh, you were mentioned. You mentioned kin selection earlier on before mm -hmm. the origin of multicellularity. Then once the death starts, it becomes a single organism. Now we have groups of organisms and so on and so forth. So um, Okasha it reinterprets the evolution of all of these major transitions uh, 
as a result of the interplay between individual selection and, and, and group selection. Mm-hmm. And I think it makes a really, really good argument, much tighter argument, even mathematically. As I said, the book is not that easy to read. But um, uh, a much tighter argument that I've seen being made by anybody else. I mean, uh, other people talk about group selection, but in a kind of a sort of hand-waving kind of way. It's like, ah, oh, well, this thing happened, that thing happened. Uh, uh, Okasha actually goes there and does the mathematical work that well, that shows. Does he does he believe the uh, there was a strong impetus then behind the growth and complexity? I think he's agnostic about that. I okay. think that that his his answer would probably be well. Once the dynamics got to a certain point, then the next logical step was going to be that one, and sooner or later it was going to happen, given enough time uh, for evolution to proceed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The. Uh yeah, the, I think the book, the uh, John Maynard Smith book, I think is called Major Transitions in yes, Evolution. I'm not, I'm not sure, but if you, yeah. uh, the, the, um, so, okay, so, so enough. I mean, you get, you get the structure of kind of my, my perspective, I think. And I think you see why I'm both agnostic about teleonomy versus teleology, um, assuming that there is in some sense, uh, that, that there is in some sense, uh, a goal. Evolution in some sense has a goal. Um, and, but and also maybe why I'm I'm kind of agnostic on the consciousness question. I mean, we we definitely see forms of life. I mean, all forms of life in some sense uh, pursue a goal. We don't assume that all forms of life are sentient. I mean, flowers could be sentient. They could have uh, some kind of uh, crude consciousness, but I, most of us don't assume it. So right. so I see. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, I, I guess certain degrees of, of behavioral flexibility are what most of us tend to associate with uh, complexity of consciousness. But uh, in any event, the, the questions aren't the same, I think you'd agree, right? Right, exactly. I think they're not the same. Uh, I mean, there's a distinction between what are, what are a logical distinction, at least, uh, between in the question of whether natural selection or whatever, or evolution is a teleonomic process versus a teleological one. That's one question. Whether there is consciousness involved, it's another mm-hmm. question. Because we, we just, a few minutes ago, we came up with the possibility that if, in fact, the, seed, the, the Earth was seeded by uh, intelligent beings, then mm-hmm. the beginning was teleonomic. Sorry, teleological, but yeah. then the, the proceeding of it, the, the the remaining, you know, the intervening four billion years was actually teleonomic. Mm-hmm. It also goes the other way around. Obviously, I mean, when we talk about teleology, as far as human beings are concerned, right, the the, uh, the ability that human beings actually do have to consciously plan and have purposes and things like that. Well, that clearly is a result of a teleonomic process uh, of natural selection. So teleonomy can lead to teleology. And, and equally so, teleology can take advantage of teleonomic systems, such as the, the genetic algorithm system that we were talking about earlier. So the distinction between the two uh, is interesting. I think it's important to keep them distinct, but they interplay. They can interplay easily. One can yeah. lead to the other and, and vice versa. So that's one of the reasons why I was critical of uh, David's turning point, because it seems to me that it was confusing a lot of different aspects of the question. And in and, and particular, con- confusing the consciousness issue on the one hand and the teleological issue yeah. on the other hand. Yeah. And, and as I said, I thought if you're going to speculate about consciousness uh, existing in a system, I would be more inclined to talk about some product of evolution like the global superorganism and say, well, maybe even as it's like something to be me at the same time, it's like something to be IBM or, or like something to be the whole the internet. Thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you, when you see a social system uh, collectively pursuing some goal as, as say an engineering team or what, for all we know, I mean, it's not impossible that, that it's like something to be the larger system, even as it's like something to be a constituent. I mean, just as when multicellular life uh, evolved, well, maybe it had been a little like something to be a, a simple cell and then, you get multicellular life, and it's like something to be the whole organism, but maybe it's still like something to be the individual. I mean, you just don't know. This To me, this is possible, but... It's possible. Um, I tend to think, as a, as a biologist, I tend to think of consciousness as an um, emergent property. I don't mean this in any kind of mystical or sort of strong sense of emergence, but just simply in the fact, the, the, the standard observation that certain properties appear... Uh, not even not just in the biological world, but even in the in the physical world world only after a certain degree of complexity or a certain number of elements are are, mm-hmm. are at play. Like for the, the obvious example is actually not biological is phase transitions uh, in 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 uh, uh, things like 
you know, from liquid to solid or liquid to, to, mm-hmm. to, to yeah. vapor and so on and so forth, right? So, I mean, the water, when it's in the liquid state, has the property, of course, of being wet, but the individual, prop- the individual molecules of water are not wet, don't have that property. Mm-hmm. That property only emerges once you have a su- sufficiently large number of molecules of water interacting in a certain, in a certain way. There's nothing magical about it, of course. I mean, we're still talking about molecules of water. But now you have a system where if you take the individual bits and pieces, they don't have a certain property. That property manifests itself only once you have enough of those uh, bits and pieces interacting in a certain way. I tend to think of consciousness in the similar way, which is one of the reasons why I don't know that I want to open that particular Pandora box. But that's one of the reasons why I am extremely skeptical of the notion of pan- panpsychism, this, this notion that consciousness is an elemental property of the universe. I don't think it is. I think of consciousness as a biological process that is emergent of uh, systems that are sufficiently large, complex, and interacting in certain ways. So far as we know, of course, we could be mistaken. Yes. Yeah. Is it a logical possibility that there is mm. the panpsychism is true? Yes, it is. But, you know. I, well, but, I mean, I guess it does make sense to me that if indeed uh, consciousness is a property of complex uh, biological systems and or complex information processing systems in general, um, and by the way, one, I guess, you know, maybe one thing people who want to think of evolution uh, as conscious are thinking is natural selection is in a certain sense a giant information processing system. But at any rate, if, uh, if you want to think of uh, consciousness as a property that accompanies, emerges with uh, th- these systems, one, uh, I guess you, you could argue that, well, the material that constitutes them then must have had some property such that when it's combined in certain ways, it yields consciousness, right? Now, that doesn't mean that the, right. pre, the prebiotic, the inanimate version of it is conscious, but it, you, can, you can see an argument that it must have some kind of metaphysical, in the respectable sense of the term, metaphysical property. Um, well, yeah, I would agree. But, but that, again, the way I cash out that, that notion, that's why I don't believe in magic. That's why I don't think that emergent properties are magical, right? right? They obviously have to depend on some more basic properties that the individual components have. Um, but again, the, I, in my mind, the, the uh, example of water is, is illuminating because, well, water at the liquid state is, is wet and it has certain other kinds of properties. You know, it freezes at a particular temperature, you know, it boils at another temperature and so on and so forth. Well, the individual molecules don't have that property. They just don't. It's not like it's there in minute, uh, you know, degrees. It, they just don't. But obviously they must have whatever other physical chemical property is right. such that when you get a bunch of them together, they become that, right. liquid that, with those characteristics. That's, that's a good analogy to what I meant. The, the, um, so, you know, we should say, I mean, I, I think it, David in his introduction, I feel a little bad that, that we're both being a little uh, critical of the way he frames this, <laughs> and he's not here to defend himself. I mean, he, he, maybe, maybe he can uh, show up and argue with one of us at some point in the future. But the um, uh, I want to say he is also in that introduction calling attention to some genuinely uh, genuinely important developments, I think, in the way evolution is being thought of. And I think he contributed to one development. He, he has gotten people to take group selection a little more seriously. Uh, I, I, think, I think in some ways the uh, ascendancy of group selectionism has been exaggerated because I think in some cases it's really a semantic question. Like if you want to argue about whether kin selection is group selection, you can argue. It doesn't, doesn't make any practical difference in, in terms of what kinds of adaptations result from kin selection. But, but I think he's played an important role there. And then I think there are – he mentions other things, uh, I- including, I think, some things you've been involved in or thought a lot about, such as what's being called epigenetics. Right. Uh, and and I think those things are important and worth calling attention to. I just don't understand why he almost seems to be conflating them with the question of consciousness. Why, yeah. why he thinks yeah. that if we're going to depart, for example, in the case of, uh, of say, epigenetics, uh, well, I don't know enough about epigenetics to say, and I'm about to turn the the the, uh, the floor over to you so you can explain it. But but why you would think that departing from the uh, old view that mutations that uh, are random in the strictest sense that they are not shaped by the environment, I don't know why you would think that departing from that 
uh, to recognize that maybe as evolution proceeds, you develop uh, mechanisms of genetic mutation right. that are themselves more conducive to successful evolution. I don't know right. why you would think that that necessarily implies consciousness at the level of evolution. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't either. Let me make two comments about one about mutations, you know, the randomness of mutations, and the other one about epigenetics. Uh, so about the mutation stuff, you know, the mutations being random. So there's some confusion there often. Mutations are not random. They're, they're, we're, we've known for a long time that mutations are not random. Uh, the notion, when, when biologists talk about mutations being random, they mean that they're random with respect to adaptive outcomes, meaning that adaptive mutations are not more likely than maladaptive mutations. But individual mutations vary in frequency in, enormously. Uh, chromosomes have hot spots. There are areas of chromosomes that, because of the way they're exposed uh, inside the cell, uh, have a much higher frequency of mutation than other areas. So some genes have much higher frequency of mutations than others. By orders of magnitude, I mean, we're talking hundreds or thousands of times more. So the does, fact that that, does that itself seem to be adaptive? I mean, in other words, if you look at which genes are, th are at that place in the chromosome, does that... Does that seem to be a good thing for the lineage, that that's where you're in, likely to get the novelty? In some cases, it is. In most cases, it doesn't seem to be. But in some cases, it is. For instance, in, in, in the case of, of uh, things that are involved with the immune response system, uh, where you need very rapid recombination, very rapid mm -hmm. generation of novelty. So, yes, that kind of stuff can be harnessed by natural selection. Natural selection can position things in a way uh, that uh, to, to sort of exploit these... these uh, uh, natural variability in the rate of, mut of mutations and say, oh, okay, well, if there are certain genes that are more like, or the other way around, some genes need to be protected from mutating too much. And so, and sure enough, natural selection has favored the, the, the evolution of a bunch of uh, systems like histone proteins to actually protect genes from, from mutation because there are certain genes that you really don't want to mess, mess around with. <clears throat> so... Mm -hmm. So there is a distinction there to be made between the randomness of the mutation process itself, we know it's not random, and the uh, randomness with respect to specific, uh, uh, you know, adaptive outcomes. That's that's an if, uh, uh, those are two different issues. As far as uh, epigenetics is concerned, so the word has been thrown around a lot these days, um, and it's almost become sort of this kind of magical word, word like like people often use uh, quantum mechanics, right? It's quantum mechanics. So, wow, well, okay, nobody understands quantum mechanics, so it must be true. Um, and the same seems to go now uh, these days for, for epigenetics. Epigenetics refers to a very interesting class of biological processes. The notion is that there are certain non-genetic elements that gets, get, get inherited from one cell lineage to another. This, this inheritance can be somatic, meaning during the development of an organism, of the same organism, so, you know, because you obviously, you, you, the, the cells that, that constituted you years ago are different from the ones that constitute you now, so there is somat somatic inheritance, those cells pass both your genes from one from one uh, round to the other, and your AP genes, and I'm going to say in a minute what AP genes are. And in some cases, epigenetic, and this is the, the the recent the relatively recent discovery is that some of these epigenetic systems not only are inherited somatically, they're not only inherited within the organism during development that has been known for a long time, but actually inherited across generations. Right. So there are some, at least some cases, it's up for debate how frequent. How frequent these cases are, uh, we know that that cross generational epigenetic inheritance is found in a number of animal species and a number of, of plant species, but it's not really clear at this moment how widespread that is. It's it's still up in there. The this the um, is there just briefly is there is there an example of that that would kind of plant this in people's minds. Uh, uh, of, a, of a specific um, kind of trait that changes in response to, I gather, the environment in some sense, and then is transmitted genetically to the next generation? Yes, uh, there are several examples. There is actually one in humans that have been described not, not that long ago when people discovered that um, there was an interesting tendency for, I believe, the grandchildren uh, of a generation of, uh, of, of Dutch people uh, to become particularly, they were particularly prone to obesity. And it was a mystery why this, this would happen. 
until somebody actually uh, traced back epigenetic markers, not genes, but, but these little molecules that actually alter gene expression. That's what epigenetic markers are. Um, turns mm -hmm. out that some of these markers respond to environmentally imposed stress. And what, what, what happened was during World War II, uh, the Dutch were literally starved by the Nazi, uh, in, especially in certain areas of the Netherlands. And those populations... Mm -hmm. Uh, therefore, it, 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 you know, were exposed to this very strong stress. Their epigenetic systems apparently responded in a certain way and communicated that information down the line. So the two generations later, uh, the grandchildren of these people are still yeah. in a kind of a save energy mode, essentially by default, which is controlled by mm. the epigenetic markers, not by their genes. The mm. genes, you know, two generations is not enough to change gene frequencies, but the epigenetic markers change very, very rapidly. And so these people, unfortunately for them, are prone to uh, become obese, not because they're particularly bad in their eating habits, but because their, their bodies start out from the get-go in a kind of a conservation of energy sort of modality, you know, me me metabolism. Okay. Okay. So that's a really nice example in humans. There are lots of other examples of similar things in, in plants and in other animals, uh, insects in particular, but also other mammals. So the epigenetic uh, effects, are, uh, epigenetic markers are these things. There are in, there's different classes of them. The best known one are uh, so-called uh, methylation patterns. Uh, these are methyl groups. These are very small uh, chemical groups that get attached to certain genes. And these methyl groups basically modulate the uh, moment and the frequency and the intensity of gene expression. So if a gene is highly methylated, it does not get expressed, or it gets expressed at a very low level. Uh, when the methylation mm -hmm. goes away, is, is eliminated, then the gene gets expressed. So what happens there, therefore, is that the, the epigenetic markers, these, these methyl uh, groups, essentially act as as a little um, dialing uh, mechanisms for the gene. You know, if you turn it all the way up, then the gene is highly expressed in a particular tissue. If you turn it all the way down, uh, it's like a dimmer, uh, and then they, the gene doesn't get expressed. The interesting thing is... So, that so just, to be, just to be clear, so we know that the epigenetic markers may get kind of like reset by the environment, and, and at that, that setting may persist into at least one more generation, but that's that's not necessarily the same as saying it would persist forever the way you might expect the gene to persist in, until it's actually eliminated? That's correct. Now, the, that's part of the thing okay. that is controversial at the moment because there are some good examples of epigenetic markers that seem to persist for tens of generations, if not hundreds. Uh, and then there are okay. other systems that are reset every single generation. So part of the question that okay. biologists are, are dealing with is, well... How frequent is the case that epigenetic markers uh, get transmitted for a long, for a, at least a medium term? Nobody that I know of has figured out, uh, has demonstrated that epigenetic markers last for many, many, many generations, for the same kind of generations that we think of in terms of long-term evolution. That's mm -hmm. one reason why people like Richard Dawkins, for instance, who we were talking about before, tend to be skeptical of the evolutionary importance of epigenetic markers. But I think that Dawkins there seems to be forgetting something fundamental, which is that evolution by natural selection happens every generation. It's not, it's not, it's not only a long-term process. It's generation by generation. So if epigenetic markers play a role in terms of inheritance, even on a small number of generations, that can make a huge difference because that can make a population survive in a stressful environment for a number of generations until uh, genetic mutations come in, uh, you know, appear naturally and then kind of sort of stabilize the system. So just because an effect, an intergenerational effect is short term, it doesn't mean that it's not important from an evolutionary perspective. But that's one of the things that it's up for debate now among, among biologists. And I, I guess you can kind of see now why David uh, Sung Wilson might, in framing this, you know, he, why he might see developments like this, like epigenetics, as maybe related to the question of whether evolution could be consciousness, because I guess the logic is like, well, the more it seems like the very mechanisms of, of mutation and the very, the, the, the kind of micro mechanisms of evolution are geared toward adaptive innovation, 
the more it seems like there's some kind of vague intentionality or something and we're associating that with consciousness. I mean, I don't personally right. buy that logic, but right. I guess that's kind of, is that kind of the logic, do you think? I think that, I think you're right. I think that's kind of the logic. The thing is, there is a major alternative, however, out there that has been developed over the last, uh, I would say, 20 years or so, and it's a concept uh, known as evolvability. And evolvability right. is this, right. Right, it's this notion that evolutionary mechanisms themselves evolve. In other words, that you get right. the appearance of new evolutionary mechanisms as a result of previous evolution that certain mechanisms themselves become favored by natural selection uh, because they're more efficient, because they you know, bring, up, bring you know, better outcomes in terms of, of survival and reproduction of the organism. So, for instance, some people, like the, the, the person that I mentioned earlier, Samir Okasha, uh, maintain or suggest that the evolution of multicellularity is one of those examples where all of a sudden, because multi, once a multicellularity evolved, as a result, presumably, of, of individual and keen selection, now all of a sudden you have the emergence of a number of new evolutionary mechanisms that were simply not possible before. For instance, recombination uh, you know, among, among large sections, section of genomes. Right. Um, so, so you do have these, the mechanisms themselves do change. Yeah. Uh, over, and over and time. I mean, to take, maybe to take an example, uh, just a hypothetical example that, that, uh, tracks more strictly on what you were saying earlier about epigenesis. I mean, you can imagine that uh, if there's a gene that, uh, I mean, I'm sure it doesn't work like this, but if you imagine a gene that uh, in a time of extreme environmental scarcity, like starvation, um, it, 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 it causes a higher rate of mutation going into the next generation of other genes than you would otherwise get, it could be that, that you know, if, if the stress of the environment is a long-term thing, that if, if, if on the planet you're on, these stressful environments tend to persist through the generations, and the stress is so extreme that you're, mo almost any organism is going to die, then it could make adaptive sense to have a mechanism that increases the rate of mutation in yes. stressful environments. Again, totally yes. hypothetical, but that would be an example of the evolution of evolvability. Right? Actually, it's not as hypothetical as you might think. Uh, oh. there, is, there is evidence of this kind of thing happening uh, in, um, um, in some, some biological systems, particularly certain, certain plants have evolved this kind of system. Uh, this is called uh, genetic capacitor or evolutionary capacitors. This mm -hmm. is the notion uh, that has been demonstrated in both Drosophila and, um, and some uh, simple plants that exactly what you just said, basically, that, that under very stressful conditions, there is an accumulation of, uh, of underlying genetic variation, which gets liberated, you know, freed all at once uh. by creating a bunch of different variants, most of which are going to die. But, you know, once in a while, that's when it's going to survive. This right. is the first system of that sort is the so-called SOS system that is known in some bacteria, which was discovered several decades ago. The SOS system is basically uh, is an alternative way of, of replicating DNA, bacterial DNA. It only get, uh, becomes functional under very stressful conditions, under conditions of heat stress or extreme starvation or things like that. And mm -hmm. basically what it is, it's a mutated uh, enzyme that 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 um, replicates the DNA. The mutated enzyme introduces a lot of mistakes, many many more mistakes than the standard replicator replicator enzyme. And the notion there is that natural selection favored this thing because you know what you're going to make a bunch of new bacteria, most of which are going to die, but it doesn't matter because the environment is stressful anyway. They were going to die anyway. Right. Uh, but out of this much, you know much higher mutation rate, somebody's going to survive. Yeah. So yeah, it's not it's not as hypothetical. There are some systems in which this is actually have, have been has been described. And I'm, I mean, I assume that uh, that David uh, Sloan Wilson uh, accepts the, the 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 possibility and maybe the likelihood that um, you know these these kinds of things you know they evolved by natural selection themselves. Sure. And I, he wouldn't think there's anything mystical about the way they arose. Uh, but but he does more than I understand for reasons I don't totally understand. I think. Uh, connect them to questions of consciousness uh, in ways that I, uh, you know, that uh, that I wouldn't. But but um, but I guess he can he 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 should feel free to argue with either of us on any platform. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the uh, but this is uh, this is fascinating. I mean, we could go on and on, and I'm glad you uh, illuminated this 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 uh, this epigenesis thing because yeah. I, I I hear you know a lot of references to it, and I've never totally understood it. Um, and uh, and I'm glad you clarified the telia teleonomic versus teleological um, thing. I wasn't always all that clear on how that uh, terminology was used. Now, are you going to, um, let's, we will link, uh, you know, on the meaning of life.tv site. Some people yes. listen to this as a podcast. Some people see this on YouTube. If they go to the meaning of life.tv site and look at the dialogue uh, the, at this video there, they'll see a, a, a something that says links mentioned. They can click on it and they'll see the link uh, to various uh, things we've mentioned. Certainly, to your piece, uh, which I think is called Conscious Evolution is a Category Mistake. Right. Um, to, and also uh, to David's introduction to the whole uh, symposium. I don't know how many contributions there have been to it yet, but but also within your piece, you link to his introduction. Yes. So, so people can read all that. Um, and uh, in general, his site is uh, the Evolution Institute, um, uh, and it has other interesting things. And I think... I think he's using the brand This View of Life, too, isn't he? To, to uh, Maybe that's the name of a blog or something. That's, of course, Darwin's, so. uh, that, that's of course Darwin's uh, closing phrase in The Origin of Species. Right. There is a grandeur to this view of life. That's right. Um, but, uh, but anyway, enough about him. Let's talk about you. What, 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 are you, what, are you, what do you want people to uh, – first of all, what, where are you on Twitter? Is, uh, what's your Twitter handle? It's M Pigliucci, M P I G L I U C C I. So it's as for you know my last name and then the initial of my first name. Uh, I can also be found on Facebook. I have a uh, official page as a, as a philosopher of science, essentially. People can find me there. And we mentioned earlier the Patreon uh, site, uh, which I guess we can link to uh, from the yeah. from the from the episode. Uh, those are the major places. I'm very active on, especially on Twitter. Uh, lots of interesting discussions going on. Uh, I try to keep them as civil as possible, which is not always that easy. No, it's not. Uh, but people are more mindful of the challenge, at least, and that's good. Uh, yes. Yeah, and I noticed that if you go, if you if you go to uh, howtobeastoic.org, that redirects you to the Patreon page. If you that's um, right. because I think at one point your blog was at that site, maybe, but you've yes, uh, relocated. That's right. That's right. For for a number of years, has been how to be a stoic dot org, and it has relocated recently to the Patreon site. Yes. And are, Which are you I still say, answering? Sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, are you still answering people's uh, self help questions there when they have? Oh them? yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's one of the, okay. the interesting features of that of that site. Uh, people ask questions, and it was you know, so how how would I deal from a stoic perspective with this problem or that problem? That's one of the most popular. Uh, kind of post that I, that I have there. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's a practical philosophy, so it, it makes perfect sense that people yeah. want to say, "Well, this is happening to me. How do I deal with, deal with it?" Absolutely is. Now, were you going to say something else before I? No, I don't think uh, so. And I, I do need to go, so we need to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing people can look for is if they go to YouTube and Google Buddhism and Stoicism, they'll probably get a conversation between you and me. Right. And if they don't, they should dismiss it and look for the one involving you and me. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, that was so thank you so much, Massimo. Really appreciate it. It's been, uh, it's been great. It was a pleasure as usual. Next time. Okay. Take, take care. No, that's okay. Uh, let me see. Let me stop the voice recorder.